But today we are going to be talking about how to make your backyard a winter bird haven. Now that might be kind of a trick because I want to also talk about habitat. So, haha, you've been tricked. We're going to talk about bird habitat. But in the snowy scenes that we have in the winter months, something like this is a welcome sight, um, allows us to escape the news of the day. Um, and during this presentation, I will be talking about what we can do right now. Um, you know, because I, I would hate to, to leave off without saying, well, we are in the middle of winter. What can we be doing right now? But I also want to spend some time talking about what we can be doing long term, making that, that habitat for birds. And if you're not so sure about birds, but you like other wildlife, well, first off, why are you here? I understand why you might be here, but um, what we do for birds, or if you're into monarchs, what we do for monarchs. If you're into wetlands, what we do for wetlands and that aquatic wildlife benefits all creatures in our ecosystem that we live in. So let us begin with what we can do right now. Now my do now plan is feed the birds. And in my mind, I really break this into two basic categories, seed and suet. Now I know there's a lot of components in suet that you can also find in seed, and there are birds that like to cross both platforms here. They, they don't mind going to the suet feeder and then going to the platform feeder. Um, but that's really in my, my brain how I like to break things down. You can, you can look at it as seed or suet in both. Um, so let's get started by talking about seed. And there's all different types of feeders that we can choose from, really. I mean, we have the, the larger uh, 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 columnar feeders, uh, and then we have the smaller ones. Uh, we have platform feeders. We have covered canopy feeders. We have uh, hopper feeders. And then, you know, we have these little birds there on the ground. You know, we have ground feeding birds. And so kind of depending upon the species, you know, we can tailor our feeder types to what we will be uh, putting out or setting out for the birds. Um, just some things to, to keep in mind. You know, one thing I've, I've noticed is just because you purchase a bird feeder from a store um, may not indicate that that manufacturer of that feeder knows everything about birds. There are definitely some instances where you purchase, uh, say, uh, some type of feeder in the perch you look at the perch, it's, it's way too small, even for smaller birds. Now, some feeders are designed for smaller birds, um, but remember, the bird, when they're on that perch, they have to bend down and feed from that, um, from that opening there. So if you don't have enough room on that perch, well, you, you may not be able to attract the kind of birds that you want. So just make sure that you are, um, doing your homework, uh, asking some questions when you go to the store to buy these things. Look at some reviews online. Now, when it comes to the type of seed, I, I highly recommend, and this is my way of life, keep it simple. For the most part, when we look at the broad spectrum of backyard birds that hang around in the winter, um, most of them, are okay with some black oil sunflower seeds. This is going to take care of seed feeders and even some meat eaters, insect eaters like a, a, a woodpecker will on occasion go after some sunflower seed. There is protein in that seed. So they will be going after that. Uh, but it's really loved by cardinals, chickadees, finches, sparrows, now you could go with an alternative here. Um, you could utilize a hold sunflower seed, which is essentially the sunflower seed without that shell on. Now birds will probably opt for that easier meal. That easier meal comes with typically a higher price tag. Um, but I will just say that black oil sunflower seeds, this is what I usually have on hand. I go to the farm store, they have these big bins of uh, different types of seed, and I just get a big bag of sunflower seed. And that's really, when it comes to seed, that's kind of what I stick with for the most part. So I like to keep it simple. 
um, I, I, I predominantly will be using the black oil sunflower seeds. Now this is the, so if, if you are getting started or if you like me, you want to keep it simple, do this. I, the next one I want to talk about is one I'm going to encourage you to avoid. That is Milo. So if I could coin a term or phrase to get stuck in your brain noodle, just say no to Milo. Now, Milo is not that bad. It's not going to hurt the birds, but they don't really prefer it. Um, it is typically used as a filler in a lot of inexpensive seed mixes. Uh, there are some birds out west that, yes, they will uh, eat Milo. Um, but for the most part, birds here in Illinois, this is the stuff that we find filtered out on the, on the ground um, or left behind in the feeders. So when you're looking at a bag of bird seed mix and you're looking at what's in, in the ingredients there, if you see a significant amount of Milo, uh, that would be, definitely be something that I would avoid. Okay, so you know what I do and don't put in feeders. What else can we utilize to feed the birds? Well, we can utilize cracked corn. Uh, cracked corn is essentially corn kernels crushed and ground up a little bit to make it more easier and accessible to um, our, our beaked friends to, to get into. Now, the other side of this too would be uh, um, whole kernels. Uh, but typically a whole kernel, you know, you could put an ear of corn out. I like to utilize those in a different part of the yard for the squirrels as a, you eat over here, leave the birds alone. And then the birds, they'll go over here. They'll get their cracked corn and their black oil sunflower seeds. Um, so I, I like to try to separate them if I can. Doesn't always work, of course. We'll talk more about squirrels later though. Another thing that you can utilize is fruit slices. Uh, pictured here, we have an orange cut in half. You could utilize grapes, raisins. Uh, do check into if you're using any type of dried or preserved fruit. Um, it is best to avoid anything like that might contain preservatives. Um, you know, or, or, you know, if you look at the ingredient list of your dried fruit and there's a lot of stuff there, eh, it's probably something to avoid feeding to the birds. We don't know if it will hurt them, but that's the thing. We don't know. So we avoid it. Now, if you want to attract different types of birds, uh, typically cracked corn could be added to say a hopper type feeder, um, a platform feeder, but really, you know, it's best utilized on the ground. You can spread it on the ground and the doves and quail will really enjoy uh, feasting on that since they're them being more ground feeder type birds. Uh, the, the fruit slices, this is something that you could hang in a tree. You could place it on a platform feeder. Um, and, and this would be something to attract like bluebirds and robins and your wax wings. There are some other things. And now one thing that I, I also have on hand in addition to black oil sunflower seed are mealworms. I really like putting mealworms out uh, for the chickadees and nut thatch and wrens um, and the, the titmice and bluebirds. So I really do enjoy uh, getting those items in the, in the feeder, scatter them on a platform. I usually put them in a suet uh, mix. Um, but then there's another one, millet. Now millet looks a lot like Milo. Um, so it's very similar, but remember, just say no to Milo. Um, millet is a little bit different. Millet is kind of, it would be a good one. Take a handful of it, throw it on underneath the feeder. This is once again, something for smaller birds, smaller ground foraging birds, your juncos and sparrows and the like. Um, maybe not necessarily something to overload a, a, a like a, a actual feeder with, but something to put on the ground. We also have niger seed. Now niger seed, it, it is become a lot more popular um, because this attracts the American goldfinch. And so people really like seeing uh, the goldfinch out in their backyard. Um, the seed is smaller. So that means it does require a, a specialized a feeder uh, that has a, a significantly smaller holes uh, in order for the bird to then access it without spilling out all over the place. Uh, usually this seed is heat treated, so it, it does not sprout because I do know um, that 
few years ago, there were issues with sprouting uh, occurring uh, with some seeds. Now, one that you will not find in uh, most bird seed mixes are oats. Now, this is an interesting thing. So I don't know about you, but with my kids, just even this last December, we had to feed the reindeer that visited our house late in the month. Our mixture consisted of shredded carrots, peeled apples, and oats. And the next day when we woke up to see had the reindeer had a feast, our backyard was littered with doves, cardinals, uh, juncos, nut thatch, all kinds of birds I had no, I mean, I had no idea would go after oats, but they were just pecking and just enjoying themselves. It was quite a sight to see. So not very common, but I thought I'd just throw that in there, something that I observed here in this past December. Now you could put something like oats on like a platform feeder if you want, or spread it on a ground. In terms of uh, feeder placement, now this is, is a, you want to see the birds, right? That's why we do this. We like feeding the birds. It's, it's entertaining for us. Um, yeah, maybe we give them a little bit of a boost during the growing, uh, during the cold winter season, but uh, most ornithologists do agree. You know, it, it, it's kind of, there's not many birds that have developed the ability to depend upon these feeders. But kind of the exception to that are hummingbirds, but hummingbirds aren't around in the wintertime. Um, so yes, it can help, but for the most part, it's for us. We enjoy this. So we want to be able to see them. In terms of feeder placement, ornithologists tend to recommend to either place them against the window. So you have, say, like a, a suction cup uh, feeder that you would put right up against the window or place it at least 10 feet away from the glass. Why at least 10 feet away? Because when a bird gets spooked, their immediate reaction is to take flight. They gotta move, they have to move immediately. They may not be quite aware what's around them. They are going to try to escape from what avenue they think is safest. Now, could it be a predator chasing them? Yes. Could it be a human walking by in your backyard that also spooks them? Yes. And as they make their dash away from the feeder, you have about two to three feet where they pick up speed very quickly and you run the higher risk of them striking your window. Now in that line of thinking, I have a bird feeder that suction cups to the window. I'd say I, I have some issues with it because every time me, my kids, wife, animals, every time any of us walk by the window inside, it spooks the birds. They see us, if not maybe a shadow of us in that window, and they, they, we spook them away. So it's kind of tough to eat when you keep getting scared off of your perch right there. So uh, again, that's kind of my own opinion there, but it's just some thought, food for thought. Okay. I kind of like this image for the last slide. Um, I'll tell, I'll mention that here in a second, but look at all of these birds congregated in this area. We do concentrate animals when we feed them. Disease can be a problem. We have to make sure that we are cleaning our feeders regularly. Now, one of the reasons why I kind of wanted to use this for the previous slide, but I didn't, do you see that it, it, it might be kind of hazy or blurry on your end? But do you see that screen mesh on the window right there? Now that mesh size, that's a little big to be actual window screening. That's because I believe what Gerald has done here is he has put deer netting up. So this feeder is near his window, but he has put deer netting so that should the bird get spooked and fly towards the window, the deer netting will cushion that blow and hopefully it will not stun it to the point where it can't fly um, or it can't escape should there actually be a predator nearby. So kind of an interesting technique um, to try to minimize window strikes. The window strikes is a huge issue, kills you know, upwards of over, a, a, from what I've seen ornithologists say, upwards and over a billion of birds every year. So that's a big issue, not only with uh, say a single family, maybe two story home, but just in doing my, my research for this presentation, high rises in the cities, seen a lot of bird strikes 
because lights at night tend to attract them because birds like to move at nighttime. So lots of, and, and there's not a perfect solutions for any of these things. Um, it's kind of a tough problem, but ornithologists are working on it, trying to come up with, with better windows, reflective re reflectivity, things to avoid window strikes. So, but for this slide, we got to clean our feeders. Um, something like this concrete feeder, you know, on a, a kind of a warmer day, uh, you want to make sure that you're cleaning out any spoiled food that's in there. If it gets wet, uh, mushy, get that out of there. Uh, you can scrub it, say, with a, a, a kind of diluted bleach solution. Uh, if it's a plastic feeder, you can take it apart, wash it in the sink. I love utilizing the dishwasher for things like suet feeders, and, and there are other bird feeders that are dishwasher safe. Um, so just something to keep in mind, keep them clean um, and avoid diseases that pop up among bird populations. All right, so we talk about seed, but now let's look briefly here on suet. Now, yes, I do use black oil sunflower seed. I do have mealworms and those go out on occasion during the winter months, but you know what is a constant in my backyard? Suet. I love utilizing suet because there's not as much debris that results from this. Yes, there are ingredients in suet. There are seed and nuts and things like that, berries that do fall on the ground that other birds can eat and that do hang around. Now, in my former home where I used to be, we had a mouse problem. And kind of the last thing I wanted to do was leave a bunch of seed lying on the ground for the mice. Fortunately, in the spring, we also had a snake. Mm, I wouldn't call them a problem, uh, but we had snakes, which was a good thing. Um, I'm not necessarily a huge snake fan when they surprise me, but when I see them before they see me, that's always a good thing. Um, so I wanted to try to avoid, uh, to reduce the amount of seed debris around my feeders. So I try to stick with suet. Again, you still get debris, but I still, I really like also watching the 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 uh, cling feeders hanging onto the, the suet cage and feeding off of there. Suet's pretty inexpensive too. Um, you know, we're going to show a video about or later on about how to make your own suet, but you know, I can go to the farm store in, in Macomb here and I can buy like uh, in bulk, you know, for a dollar per suet cake. It's not too bad. Um, and the, the birds, the woodpeckers, uh, they all really seem to like it. Um, in terms of what's in suet, when you look at the commercial stuff, a lot of it's made of beef kidney fat. Um, if you decide to make your own, as you can see, the, the, uh, the mode of transport here is fat. Uh, you could go to the butcher and it, you could say, hey, do you have any beef kidney fat? And a good butcher probably does, and it's very inexpensive. Um, but there are some folks, and you will find videos online, taking bacon grease and other fried or cured meats, uh, the fats from those, and using those. We would like to avoid those because, let's face it, even human beings shouldn't be eating that much bacon that we probably already do. So let's try to avoid using any type of salt or cured or processed uh, types of uh, meat fats. Oh, and also, and we mentioned this later, but in warm weather, there are instances where your homemade suet could turn rancid. So as it gets warm, your suet can turn rancid and uh, could not be good for the birds. So uh, make sure that you are keeping an eye on that and take it down if you go out there and it's definitely kind of a melty gooey mess. A good question. When do you start feeding and when do you stop? Should you feed all year long? Are you setting up a system where these birds will depend and rely on that for their entire year that they're in your yard if you have year-long uh, inhabitants? Well, again, most of these birds probably have a native food source that they go for. You are supplementing that with your, with your bird feeder. For me, I like to start feeding in the fall. This allows some food, some nutrition, some energy to go into those migrating birds that pop by during the fall months. I then like to continue feeding, as I mentioned, predominantly suet throughout the winter months. I then start to taper that off as we start getting warmer weather. Yeah, typically March, 
You know, that might be the last time I set up my, my final suet cake for the year. Because the birds, for the most part, are going to be switching modes. They're not going to be having to use as much energy for keeping warm, but they're going to switch to nesting and breeding. And that is a different, that requires a different diet for them. So I, I typically stop feeding in the spring. And, and as I did more reading for this presentation online, I will read a quote from an ornithologist here. They said, a wise person would suggest to save your money once insects become abundant in the spring. I think that's good advice. And as we talk about habitat later, how do we get those insects in our yard? We will cover that. It can't be a bird feeding presentation without a picture of a squirrel. Okay, so the other animals. We want to feed the birds. The squirrel doesn't know that. The raccoon, the possum, they see food. We are putting out a buffet, which we hope to feed birds with, but we don't get that choice. Other animals are going to see this and they will try to take advantage of that. They see food. That is their instinct. When it comes to squirrels, this is the bird lover's delight. Or should I put it in a different way of the pursuit of keeping the squirrels off of the feeder is your maybe a secret delight. Do you, I mean, isn't it kind of fun to watch a squirrel fall off a feeder because they can't get to it? You kind of enjoy seeing that, right? It's very difficult to keep squirrels off of feeders. There's lots of different um, you know, designs and engineering that goes into feeders to keep them away. Uh, Spring-loaded poles that if a squirrel jumps on it, the feeder bounces up and down and uh, jumps them off. Uh, scare tape, all kinds of things. But really, one of the best things you can do is place feeders about 10 foot from any protective cover. Um, you can utilize baffles and trick poles like that or bounce up and down that they can't climb. Um, there are squirrel proof, proof feeders, which this one pictured is obviously not. Squirrel proof feeders are usually pretty unsightly and might not be something that you would be hanging up in your yard, but they do exist. Or do as I do and bribe them to a different part of the yard. Now, let's say you have other birds that you don't want around, sparrows. Um, avoid millet. Sparrows like smaller seeds, so don't put out millet. You're not going to totally exclude them, but you know, you, you can try to steer in the direction of where, what your desirable species are. But as I said, you don't get to pick who comes to the buffet. Deer, raccoons, um, boy, that's tough. Deer, you gotta put them up high. Raccoons, you gotta, oh boy, I don't know. But I do know if you do have a raccoon issue, perennial raccoon issue, they don't like human voices. Um, Peggy Doty, our environmental educator, recommends take a radio outside and put it in a weather safe place or it's a weather safe radio and turn it on to talk radio, put like a bucket over it or something, turn it on and the raccoons will stay away because they hear human voices. Doesn't work for any other animal, but it can work for raccoons. Possums, you know, people don't like seeing possums. They think they're ugly. Possums are delightful. They are like Hoover vacuums underneath the bird feeders. Um, they are very beneficial organisms. So we, uh, if we can, try to welcome them. Um, you might live in a part of the country, I do not, where there are bears. If you start having issues with bears or even deer, raccoon, what another option is, is to take the feeder completely down for a few weeks, let those animals move on and then put it back up. Now I will share with you what happened to me a few years ago, I mean, no, more than a few. I was putting out my suet feeders in my backyard and it was so quiet that year. I don't know if I ever changed the suet cakes with you know December, November, uh, January came, almost full suet feeders. And as I walk around the neighborhood and you know around people's backyards, um, we had a common green space, I'm not spying on people here. Um, I would see these little piles of feathers everywhere. You know what I thought? Cats. Cats are stalking my bird feeders. They are eating the birds and keeping the others away. It wasn't until one winter day I was taking a walk with the dog 
and the kid, and we saw this. Now you can barely see that, but let me zoom in just a little bit. I was still feeding the birds, but not as I quite expected. Predation is a thing in the wild. It breaks our heart. But again, if we set up a buffet, we can't pick who comes to eat. And some of us want, or some of who show up, want to eat the other people at the buffet. So this is a bird feeder hawk. Now, I did once have this identified by an ornithologist, but I've forgotten what they said. It's either a sharp shinned hawk or a Cooper's hawk. Cooper's hawk once close to an endangered uh, or, or threatened species, has really rebounded. Ornithologists credit this, they believe, with an increase in backyard bird feeding. These birds, or hawks, they hunt and stalk backyard bird feeders. Other birds, they, uh, they know they're around, they send out their warning calls, and the feeders tend to remain quiet until these uh, aerial hunters move on. If your feeders are still pretty busy and you keep getting uh, hawks, I mean, keep in mind, you're, you are technically feeding birds, but you can, once again, take your feeders down for a few weeks. The hawks will move on. Um, I mentioned the Cooper's hawk, you know, had tr trickled down towards threatened uh, species. They, I mean, they are on a rebound now. So don't feel like, you know, you will be starving them because they are going to find a meal somewhere else. All right, now that was what we do now. Let's talk about long-term, making bird habitat. This is really, as a landscaper, what I like. Um, this is kind of where I thrive. I enjoy this. I love uh, plant and design. I love creating space for wildlife. And birds are a great uh, tool for observing how impactful our efforts can be in our very own backyards. Now this is because they are so mobile. We can see them move into an area. That puts them as a great metric to measure our habitat uh, manipulations. It's a little bit harder when you're trying to track that using snakes or other amphibians, which are also great indicators, but they like to hide. It's harder to see them. Birds, they're flying around above our head. They're calling out in the air. Uh, we can see sometimes they're nesting. There's a lot of good ways to track them. And so it's, it, it's a way for us to see that we are making a difference. Birds are also ecologically important. Without our bird feeders, they still go out and they eat seed from plants that developed that previous growing season. So they are seed dispersers. And yes, they are food for others. They are part of that food web. Predation is just a way, that's just a way it is when it comes to nature. And another thing is they are wonderful at consuming insects. A very important part of our food webs. Now, if you could, if you want to try to break this apart a little bit, um, and I know we have people from all over the country actually dialed into this call, a, a few people from other, uh, other countries, in fact. So um, think about what you want to attract. Maybe what is your historically native uh, vegetation that was there? Now, bird groups can be divided into guilds, and this is primarily based upon their preferred nesting habitat. Um, so as an example, you can have a guild of early successional birds. So early successional forests, um, kind of forests that have just been disturbed, uh, wildfire, um, you know, humans. Uh, so what comes up? Well, quick growing, uh, kind of brambly, brushy type areas. There are birds that thrive in these, like pictured here, the gray catbird. Um, or on the flip side of that, we have old established or climax forest guilds. Um, you know, so you that would again attract other types of birds that like that large canopy with that kind of under uh, uh, canopy area for flying around and space for that. So where I'm at, typically we might be seeing some of that climax forest species, some of that successional, but for the most part, 
we were prairie. So we're gonna be looking at grassland birds. Um, but really where I'm at in central Illinois, it, it, is, it is a mix. Um, we were looking at uh, upland prairie and uh, hillside, bottomland, riparian, oak hickory, climax forest. So, and also savannah type prairie. So there's a lot of different, different types of habitats out there. It, but this is fun research to do. It's, hist it's history, it's fun. And if you want to get a mix of birds, you need a mix of habitat. You need that brambly, brushy area. You need an area with tree canopy that has open area for them to fly and uh, hunt and roost and mate and breed. And then wetland, grassland. I mean, we could keep going here. So we have other things to talk about today. So let's start out. Where do you begin? Well, I always begin because I was trained as a designer to take an inventory. What is around you? What exists in the moment at the present time? Let's ask yourself some questions. Do you have a balance of woody and herbaceous species in your yard? Okay. Now we could dial in a little bit here. Let's look at woodies. Now, do you have a variety of evergreen woodies and deciduous woody trees? Both of them play a role in a bird's life cycle. Evergreens provide year-round cover and food, but that cover is really important. Deciduous trees, they, yes, also provide some cover and shelter, but they are a great food source. And when we look at research that is ongoing and coming out, uh, I know Doug Tallamy is kind of the, the, the poster researcher for that, uh, the oak tree in particular, uh, as a vital food source for insects, which, who eats those? That's right, the birds. Now look around your yard. Are there any non-natives that you could part with? I'm gonna talk about this here in a few slides, but I will say I have not moved into, been into uh, uh, another home, house property where I haven't seen burning bush, Ioannum salatus. I'll talk about that later, but are there any non-natives that you could part with? So we're going to talk about burning bush here in a second. And then what's missing? Is there something that you've always wanted? Is there a tree that you remember from your childhood? Um, you know, just ask what, what, what else could there be? So that, that's your inventory. As you start to build a backyard birdscape, we start to think about, all right, now, it's kind of what's there, kind of what I want, but what do birds want? Okay, we need the four basic things that all living orga organisms need. Food, shelter, water, space. Food, we need insects. Yes, as I mentioned, birds, lots of birds, predominantly uh, at some point in their life cycle, depend upon insects. Nectar, yes, birds, some birds are nectar feeders. I remember we moved into our new house just recently and the former owner had the um, just red columbine everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And I thought, oh goodness, I got all this columbine everywhere. Uh, it just spreads like crazy, like mad, now, sitting out on the patio and hummingbirds just absolutely everywhere. They knew that columbine has been there for years and years and they knew to come back there. Just absolutely fascinating. The other homeowner also had some coral bells, foam flower, heuchera, um, tubular, other tubular flowers that also attracted hummingbirds. I actually have a mecca for hummingbirds in my backyard and I had no idea. Now I love it. So what is a weed to some person can be an absolute delight to a different person. And of course, berries, uh, great fall energy for those migrating birds, seeds for the winter birds, and nuts again. What you are doing is you are building a food chain in your yard. Birds also need shelter. Dense shrubs, tree brush piles. Um, so we have brush piles. Uh, I grew up in a, you know, my dad always had brush piles. And it was always so much fun when you walk over to the brush pile, you see the birds scatter out of there. because they use that as shelter. Um, rock piles, hollow trees. And we'll talk about snags in a second. Um, shrubs. Let's dial in here. They provide good structure for not only the birds, but also for your landscape. They provide food. It's a windbreak. Typically, shrubs tend to be a bit denser, so good protection from predators. Also a place for nesting. 
uh, if you have a species who likes to nest closer to the ground. Native perennials. So some of the research that came out of Ptolemy's work showing that when they look at the, uh, I think it was, was it the black cat chickadee? If I'm wrong, you can correct me in the chat. Um, they compared native landscapes to non-native ornamental, you know, conventional landscapes. And they started at 100% native plant species. And then they dialed it back, dialed it back. You know, they looked at different sites, dialed it back, and they measured the amount of uh, chickadees that were there on site. And once they got below 70% native plant species, the chickadees disappeared. I am not a natives only person, but I am definitely an advocate for native plants. They support native pollinators. They also support the native herbaceous eating insects, the low folks on the food chain, which in turn support the birds. Water. We'll talk about bird baths in a second, but streams, puddles, bird baths, drip faucets. You know, I water my trees, my newly planted trees with a hose or strip, drip, dripping. There are some days um, for uh, some of my newly planted trees, uh, just an absolute party at the end of that hose uh, with, with bir different birds coming in, getting a drink, having fun, cleaning themselves up. It was awesome to see. And space, quiet space, open space, space for reproduction, corridors, territories. Now, what is the goal of all of this, really, truthfully? Yeah, we want to have birds, but what, do we, what does that mean? Well, we want to have birds having babies. We want reproduction to take place because mom and dad, they see these things and they say, hey, I, I can support my family here. I think I'm going to build a nest. And we get this. We get, we get new life, new reproduction. So um, that is truly the goal. I know we're talking about winter bird feeding, or that's at least how I lured you into this presentation, but really we're trying to create habitat to make a place for future generations of birds. And from a design perspective, you might've heard it once, but I'm gonna say it again, we think in layers because birds utilize different layers in our landscapes, um, sometimes exclusively, not usually sometimes at different parts of their life cycle or at the same time of their life cycle, whether it's hunting down down the ground, nesting up in the top canopy of the tree. So we're gonna look at these uh, different layers here in the landscape. I'm gonna give some uh, examples, ideas. We can't go over every single plant, of course not, but let's start with ground cover. Shredded leaves, not shredded leaves. Leaves, debris. This is great fodder for birds because what's in that? Insects nesting material. This is the stuff that is out in the woods naturally. So maybe we can have a little spot in our yard also for some leaf cover. Virginia creeper, um, you know, poison ivy. Why would he ever recommend poison ivy? Well, this is probably not one you want, but the birds do utilize it. Um, and I don't want to totally say, ah, turf grass is bad, evil, evil, evil. I'm a landscaper at heart, so I like turf. I think it is a viable ground cover. Have you ever watched a robin hunting worms in the turf? It's fun, it's good to see. We can utilize turf as pathways, play areas, barbecues, places for kids to run around and to put a swing set, but our landscapes should not define, or sorry, our our turf grass should not be the defining thing of our landscape. Uh, I'm, you know, I say it all the time. I'm saying it right now. Our landscapes should define the turf grass. We use plants to shape the lawn space. Unfortunately, a lot of places do it the other way around. That's kind of my philosophy. Um, the other thing, Solomon seal. Uh, you can utilize uh, kind of woodland flocks, Canadian ginger, and kind of a, 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 a wooded understory ground cover. Um, but the ground cover, that is your canvas to begin painting in the other layers. And hopefully, you can acquire a living mulch of plant material, dead leaves, 
you know, microorganisms, macroorganisms that can support the basis of your food web. We move up to the herbaceous layer, kind of ties into the ground cover layer. Um, but we are beginning to get higher and higher. Um, this can be and often is the most diverse layer. Uh, this is where we often plan for seasonal color as the perennials, they come in and out of bloom. Now, it can be diverse, as I said, like the photo on the left. Now, that's a picture by Doug Tallamy. He supplied uh, for a former presentation uh, we've given in the past. Uh, but look, we've got cardinal flower, yarrow, joe pie weed. It looks like there might be some, some carrots or sedge in there. I can't tell. That might be some uh, tick seed. Um, uh, weeping cherry right there on the right side. So very diverse, a diverse setting. But I don't want you to think that you have to plant all willy-nilly from a design perspective and also a maintenance perspective. Mass planting, as the picture on the right indicates, also from Talamy, um, is just mass plantings of two species, aromatic aster and large-rooted heuchera, or heuchera, however you like to pronounce it. It gives a visceral punch, and it kind of makes maintenance easier, because if you're like me, you got an HOA to deal with. So you got to make sure you can maintain these things and it looks intentional. Now, this is just a, a picture. I It was on All About Birds. I loved it. This isn't Junko, uh, feasting on the seeds of a fall aster. Um, let those herbaceous plants stand. I know it is a gar, I mean, if I was talking to you 10, 20 years ago, I would have said, boy, you better cut down all those plants in the fall. Your garden's going to look really uh, uh, ratty. But you now know what all of us extension folks are saying now? Leave them. Leave them up. Birds will eat the seeds. Insects will live within those stems. That is next year's food or this winter's food for the bird, for the junco. So leave the stems standing. As we move up a little bit higher, we get into the shrub layer. Now pictured here is the American beautyberry. Um, there's also a Japanese version of this, the Japanese beautyberry. Um, but American beautyberry, Calicarpa americana, um, fall uh, bearing uh, berries. Uh, this is one that I remember seeing when I was at school down in Carbondale. Absolutely fell in love with this plant. Um, and this is would be a food source for fall migrating birds and also birds in the early winter months. Other things you could try though, blackberry, kind of brambly type shrubs. As I mentioned before, there are species like that gray catbird that utilize those dense shrubby areas for nesting, life, living. Um, we could also look at smaller viburnum species, native viburnum species. Now, the thing I love about shrubs is that um, kind of, a little bit unlike herbaceous plants, which, you know, they do die back to the ground. Shrubs are ever present and they are great for defining a space. Um, and, and as your shrubs, as you put them in, you start to, you feel like your landscape starts to get a skeleton. You know, it's that ever present structure that's always there. It's also another source of seasonal color, texture and food sources. And if you're like me, you have neighbors that need to use shrubs to screen the undesirable views because I, I tend to like the weeds. This is an example of, as we look from ground cover, herbaceous up to the shrub layer, the shrub there on the right, bottle brush buckeye, sclevis parviflora. Um, bottle brush buckeye, you can see, doesn't that just look like amazing bird habitat in there? If I was a bird, I would want to dive in there you know, roost around in there, have a good time in there, but look at the structure that it creates. And from a design perspective, look at that interest it creates in that pathway. I kind of want to go around that pathway. I want to see what's on the other side. From a, from a perspective of getting people interested in being outside, we kind of have to have that in mind too. <laughs> We're all, we all love the outdoors, but we also have to kind of design for the experience of others. All right, let's move a little bit higher into the understory layer. Now this, these are smaller trees, maybe larger shrubs. Uh, pictured here, we do have Cirsus canadensis or the uh, red bud. Um, I absolutely love red bud. I don't know how much bird or how much wildlife value it has, but as a childhood thing, when I look at my inventory list, 
And I remember red buds as a kid. I loved them. I'd go out and I'd pluck up a couple of those flowers, sweet pea, nutty uh, nectar inside those flowers, chomp on them. It, it holds a spot for me. And it's a native plant. It's a good edge species too. Um, so we, we obviously here, we have our red bud, larger viburnums. Um, and we, we start to transition up, up from shrubs. We're going up into the canopy. Uh, ironwood, musclewood, hot hornbeam. Uh, it has lots of names. Uh, we're starting to think about fall color too. Uh, we're looking at berries. We still have flowers to contend with. And we can still plant these in mass. It's, I've seen some beautiful plantings of redbud um, and flower in the springtime. Another one that I like, but that tends to get a foliar fungal disease in my neck of the woods is pagoda dogwood, Cornus alternifolia. Pagoda dogwood, as you can see in this image here, has these, this strong horizontal branching structure. Uh, kind of gives it that Chinese pagoda architecture. Uh, white flowers in the spring, uh, you know, yes. Does it produce bird food? Yeah, because there's insects that eat the leaves. Hmm, yummy, yummy bird food. So pagoda dogwood, this is one that I'd like to have in my landscape. Again, I know I'm probably going to be dealing with fungal disease issues. Eh, I'm willing to, to give it a try at least. Uh, so a decent plant. This is a cedar waxwing feasting on, thankfully, a more uh, recommended uh, small tree. Uh, you tend to see this tree recommended very often when you get into a native plant presentation. This is Juneberry or serviceberry. Uh, Amelanch here uh, is the uh, genus. Uh, there's a Canadensis, Americana. Uh, there's hybrids of it as well. Now you know you have a good uh, tree when or a bird food source when humans like it and the humans got to fight the birds for the fruit. Um, I recall when I was an intern at Missouri Botanical Garden and the uh, horticulturist we were driving by in the Cushman and he said, reach out and grab a bunch of those berries, pop them in your mouth. I thought I was being, uh, 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 he was pulling a trick on me, but he wasn't. They were delicious. And he said, tomorrow, all those berries will be gone. And sure enough, the birds had come through and totally stripped off all the berries on there. There grow with cerebrus berries there. So a uh, very nice, very neat plant. Now let's get to the very tippity top, the canopy layer. Pictured here is an interesting tree, typically a southern species. Uh, this is pecan tree, uh, Caria illinoensis. Uh, but a uh, lot of uh, botanists kind of credit Native Americans with spreading the natural range of this tree up a little bit farther north. Yeah, can you grow this in central northern Illinois? Probably. Are you going to get the, the kind of the fruit yield as you would down south? No. Um, but they can grow pretty big and pretty tall. Other canopy trees to think about, um, tulip poplar. I love tulip poplar. I always have, and I'm learning more and more reasons why I like it. Uh, actually, cedar waxwing will eat the flowers of tulip poplar. Uh, so tulip poplar, also known as tulip tree, scientific name, Liriodendron tulipifera. I always got to make sure to clarify that because there's lots of different common names or similar common names out there. Um, Oaks. I mentioned oaks before, an incredible food source, maybe one of the best food sources, as indicated by a lot of uh, research that's coming out right now for, uh, for birds. Um, hickories, uh, again, another good food source. But canopy layer, this is the ceiling of the garden, critical habitat for a lot of wildlife, including some bird species out there. Because different species are going to utilize different parts of those layers, as this as this illustration indicates here. From uh, this is from Texas Parks and Wildlife, uh, so some of the maybe the species might not be as common in Illinois or in your neck of the woods. But um, this just goes to show, like all the different bird species that utilize the different canopy layers. Have you ever watched an owl navigate its way through the understory of a woodland? It is a sight to behold. It's like a a stealth jet fighter, no noise, just weaving its way between branches and trunks and leaves. It is so neat to see. So layers are important. Now this was above my patio a few years ago. This is a bald-faced hornet's nest. We never noticed the hornets. They never bothered us. It was never an issue, but once the leaves fell, there they were. But they don't, they're not perennial. 
the, they're annual, so they're, they abandon their nests when it gets cold out. And you see all those dark holes there? That's birds going in for a little feast because there's still dead bugs, maybe a few half living uh, hornets in there that they can go in and just tear apart. So that again, canopy, it's a good place uh, and one we don't often notice. This is kind of another uh, image here, again, from Ptolemy uh, and also Rick Dark uh, from their book, The Living Landscape. This is kind of what their idea behind a, a layered landscape. We have the water, the ground cover, herbaceous, shrubs, small trees, large trees. So very nice, uh, very beautiful. Um, I might need a little bit more room on my property to do something like that. But hey, you know, I can, I can strive for that goal in a smaller scale. Let's talk a little bit about the plants we could live without. Like I said, I've moved every house I've lived in, been in, there's probably been a burning bush somewhere around on their property. Now this is a photo of uh, a natural area here in Macomb, Illinois. Um, this is Euonymus elatus, burning bush, very common landscape plant, not a non-native. Uh, you can see here in the foreground and the background, this entire hillside of this woodland is covered in uh, burning bush. It has escaped from cultivation. It is taking over the understory of the forest. Now you might say, well, it's beautiful. looks nice, you know, whatever it holds the soil, yada, yada. So of course, but the one thing is though, what eats burning bush? In my years of having burning bush on my yard property, I can say I can't find many things. There's not much, many holes that develop over the course of the year when I'm looking closely at my burning bush. So, what do I typically do when I move into a new place? Well, I usually plant uh, a respective uh, kind of analog to the burning bush that would be native so that I can turn something that might be a, a food vacuum into a food source. This is another Ptolemy photo that he graciously provided um, for uh, extension horticulture here in Illinois. Um, this is a wide-eyed Vero feeding her young uh, nestlings here. Uh, she's feeding them insects because yeah, could does seed have protein? Sure does, but not the kind of protein a nestling needs, a young, young bird needs. Now, when food is scarce, when they can't find the protein punch that meat has, like this caterpillar, they, a lot of bird species will turn to feeding their nestlings seed, often to their detriment. Typically, nestlings cannot process that type of uh, food. Um, so uh, sometimes they starve, sometimes their growth is stunted, um, but they're the parent, you know, the parents, they're desperate to find food for their babies. And so they are going to start feeding them. So if I can have more plants in my yard being eaten by bugs, which then can in turn feed some birds, that's getting to my goal here. Now let's hit cover here real quick. Um, birds need cover for nesting. Now we saw this image already, but look in the background there. You know, good open space foreground, but background, there's some cover. Now where I am here in central Illinois, we are not known for our evergreens. Again, tall grass prairie, oak hickory forest. But we do have native species, Eastern red cedar, Juniperus virginiana. Um, we do have some non-native spruces like blue spruce. We don't recommend planting Bruce, blue spruce anymore, but hey, it is pretty good cover. Um, it has a lot of issues here in Illinois, so I still wouldn't prune, plant it. Um, so maybe a, a Korean fir, uh, something like that as an alternative. But eastern red cedar, uh, possibly white pine, but you got to be real careful with white pine. They tend to just decline after about 20 to 30 years here in Illinois. Um, and then also place bird feeders about 10 feet from cover. Well, you think, why don't you put it in the cover? It's easy access. Well, yes, but birds aren't the only one using the cover to keep them hidden. There are predators that will utilize cover, kind of thinking of those, those meow predators. All right, dead tree snags. Now, a lot of birds, uh, like, this, like woodpeckers, as you can see here, they, they might nest or feed upon uh, dead trees. And what are they feed? Are they eating the tree? No, they're eating the insects that are going and decomposing that dead wood. Now, if you don't have any uh, snags in your area, you can supplement that nesting space by hanging some type of a bird box. There's lots of different species that you can build your box for. All About Birds, a Cornell uh, website, is a fantastic resource if you want to build your own, so they have plans there, 
um, or you know, looking for places to order a bird box. Pictured here is a, a blue bird box. Um, and so you, you, you can build them to a specification, put on a pole, don't put them on a tree. I know, yes, we wanna put them on a tree. It looks so rustic, but don't. And install a predator guard. And you don't have to take the box down every year, but clean it out at the end of every single nesting cycle. Predator guards, all right, they are a necessity. We once got a cute little wren house um, for a Christmas present. We put that thing up in the spring, put it on like a big tall garden hook. Oh yeah, it was great. And the male wren, he just showed up and he started singing his song. The female showed it up, as it showed up, they started building their nest. We watched it all spring and we saw that, heard the little babies chirping like, oh, this is, this is like a Disney movie. And then one morning we wake up and we hear the wren's a different call, just a very panicked call. And we go out and we look and the mom and dad, we can see them dive bombing this little head sticking out of the wren nest box. It was a black snake, similar to the one pictured there on the right. The snake had crawled up the thin, narrow hook, garden hook, and crawled into the nest box and had a delightful breakfast can't blame the snake. The snake, that they're just doing what nature intended for them to do. They're seeing a meal, they're going for it. Uh, if you blame anyone, blame me for not putting up some type of predator guard. Um, so if you do put up a predator guard, uh, picture on the left here is some type of a cone guard. On the right is a cylinder guard. Some people will put the cylinder guard and they won't close that interior opening. Well, the snake will just go right up inside there or raccoons or whatever. Also, if you install your bird house box next to vegetation and you put the guard on, that guard's useless because the animal is just going to go over to the vegetation and then jump off or slither off onto the nest box. So plant it away where animals can't jump or slither down onto um, that nest box or bird house. Bird baths. I'm just gonna, very briefly, water tends not to be a limiting factor when it comes to birds. So uh, place the bird bath where you can see it, make sure it's being used, clean it out, give them somewhere to perch. Um, you know, it can be about two to three inches deep, put some pebbles in there, have a nice rim around it where they can perch on um, and clean it at least once a week. The other thing I would add and that I enjoy watching is birds giving themselves dust baths. So we have a southern exposure in our backyard. Uh, it's mulched, but in the spring, it's pretty neat to pull that mulch back. You let it dry out. Not only would say ground nesting bees, which are beneficial, um, uh, utilize that, but we watch birds give themselves dust baths. So it's kind of fun to watch that too. All right, maintenance. How do you take care of this place? Well, try to maximize the amount of undisturbed areas. Remember birds need quiet space, space for them to do their thing, to live. Put a spot for people to be active. Maybe that's the spot where we all have our, have our dinner, barbecue. It's where the bird watching occurs. Preserve existing trees if it is safe to do so. Some trees are not safe to have around. Have those evaluated by a certified arborist. Go to our local preserves and parks and see what you might want to incorporate. And minimize pesticide use and please accept the weeds. My favorite plant the common blue violet, a wonderful lawn plant. I wouldn't call it a weed anymore. I do enjoy it too much. Now, if you want to get some more information in the uh, mobile device realm, uh, these are some apps that you can download, a few of them free, a few of them not. Uh, Merlin, eBird, uh, both by Cornell, are free downloads. A really good field guide, Sibley's, uh, the second edition is available for $20. Um, that's a lot, but good guide. There's also the Audubon Bird Guide, which is now free. I once paid $15 for that, but well, okay, now it's free. And iNaturalist is another good kind of social media realm for naturalists to get together and share pictures and ID stuff. Boy, I couldn't promote this more uh, uh, if I tried all about birds, Cornell Lab. Check it out. This is the place. This is my main source of information right here. So check out all about birds out of Cornell. Get involved with citizen science stuff too. Do bird stuff. 
you know, I say do bird things, you know, get, get, just get out there. Citizen for community science, nest watch, feeder watch, um, competitive ver- birding, which is very competitive as I found out, uh, participate in a Christmas bird count, uh, develop a life list, just check them off. As you get new birds, just check off your life list. Duck stamps are still a thing that support bird conservation. Call up your local science group. They might need help banding birds or maybe checking traps. Get involved with local groups like Audubon or wildlife research groups. So do bird things. That's just another good thing that we can be doing. If I could leave you with anything, I wanna let you know that your actions matter. If you can't afford to create a bird uh, paradise in your backyard, but you can plant one plant for keeping them that supports bird, uh, a bird activity, do it. You know, we have 157 people here on this call right now. If we all did that, can you imagine that's, uh, what if we planted two plants in our backyard that supported, supported birds? That would be fantastic. The other thing, as I leave you, and Andrew mentioned this earlier, he said, you know, we sent out a supply list in our email. The one supply that we didn't mention, small hands. By that, I mean children. These are activities that are simple. They're fun for adults. But if you could involve your kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, do them and put them up so that the neighbor kids can see them. For the future generations, we are not going to get them interested. They're not going to care about this stuff if we do not expose them right now. Well, I am so glad you made it to the end of uh, the webinar here. Just so you know, at the end of the presentation, we had four videos where we showed how to build four different types of homemade bird feeders. So if you'd like to check those out, we will leave those links below in the description. Uh, hopefully you will build these. Uh, while yes, they are fun for adults, they are fairly simple. And we hope that you include some kids and your kiddos along with that. Don't have kids? Well, we hope that you still uh, make these feeders or put up your own bird feeders so that you can share in the nature's display of birds that occur here in Illinois every single winter with those around you. Have a great day.